By day, my next guest is the chief financial officer at a large investment firm in New York. He's also a devout Catholic who has taken to the street to evangelize the financial district. It's an amazing story detailed in his new book, Missionary of Wall Street, from managing money to saving souls on the streets of New York. I sat down with him here in Washington recently to talk about it. Here's my exclusive interview with Stephen Off. Stephen, I want to start after more than 40 years on Wall Street. In 2002, you have a heart event and a priest walks in. And this really sets you down a whole new path. What happened? Yeah, I was in the middle of the financial crisis. And you know, it was a very stressful time and mm. electrical malfunction. And, uh, you know, at that point in my faith journey, I had gone from an altar boy growing up in the streets of Newark to, finally, I would call myself an indifferent agnostic. Mm. And then gradually, after I got married to the girl of my dreams, who was devout Catholic, I became what I would call a Sunday Catholic. Ah. And that's where I was when Father gave me last rites mm. and my first confession in probably 30 years. Wow. And what did he say to you? Uh, well, it took a while. Uh, and then he said, Steve, uh, you know, your guy has been given a lot of talents by the Lord, and you've been a very poor steward of them. Hmm. And that really struck me, mm -hmm. you know, struck home. And I said, well, if I survive this, I'm going to give my talents to the Lord and hmm. wait to hear the call, and I'll answer it. And your wife signs you up for a Holy Week mission. Uh, tell people what that is and why you were so hostile to the idea of it. Right. It was another financial crisis, 2009, and the call came in from my wife, mm -hmm. really, but it was really from a priest down at Old St. Pat's in Soho, you know, old Catholic neighborhood that had become gentrified, one of the most affluent neighborhoods in the city. Mm -hmm. Parish had kind of fallen away. Yep. I know it well. And, uh, yeah, the wife calls up and says, Steve, I signed us up to do this mission. And I said, sweetheart, what do you mean mission? She says, you know, a mission in the street, so we're going to call Catholics. Oh, I go, sweetheart, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know, never going to work. I mean, I know New York. I grew up right. all my life. The NYU kids yeah. and the hipsters. We're going to be having cigars put out in our foreheads. And, you know, like I'm the chief investment officer of a big company here. You know, I mean, I'm all for answering the call, but this but, is crazy. And, so, and did you do it? Well, yeah, two weeks later, I was on the streets in New York. And course. what was that first experience like? About what I expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one mm -hmm. of the first women I tried to stop, um, clearly a devout atheist, I would call her, mm -hmm. called me a pedophile. Mm. Uh, someone else handed me a bag of dog dung. Yeah. Nice. The uh, hat seller on the corner, um, who appears in the missionary of Wall Street mm -hmm. as a character that comes and goes and right. is eventually converted, actually. Really? By, but at the time, his, his reaction is, I paid for this corner, and the missionaries come up to see me and say, the hat seller wants us off his corner. And I said, well, he didn't pay for the whole corner, so <laughs> let's move three feet away from him uh -huh. and stay at your post. Mm -hmm. And um, it is interesting. He, he is eventually converted. Uh, towards the end of the book, uh, he ends up closing his hat stand and giving all 120 of his hats uh, to the missionaries, who at that time had grown to a large force of people. Wow. Um, How did you, after that first experience, which was not a good one, <laughs> as you relate in the book and as you right. just related, why do, you, why do you continue to go back? Something happened, Raymond. Um, even then, there were a couple of stories, but I would say about a year later, uh, there's a story that's related in the book of my, um, I stop a man who says he's been there, done that. You know, are you Catholic? Mm -hmm. Been there, done that. Mm -hmm. 40 years. Mm -hmm. And this is a way too long a story for this show, but I'll just the, the nut and bolts of it is the series of coincidences that led him to me and um, it turned out he was on death's door. Mm. And there was something in my background about a painting at the Metropolitan Museum, mm -hmm. the Supper to Emmaus, yep. that related directly to this man's problem. And he himself had been in front of this painting a day earlier and didn't understand it. Uh. And yeah, okay, 
I think his life was changed, I hope. I, you know, the missionary never really knows. Right. You know? You're a part of the journey. You're not but the it, whole... Right? Yeah, yeah. We're just agents of the kingdom. We're not kings of the kingdom. So, so walk me through specifically, just so the audience understands. What exactly do you do? I have to say, the idea of being a missionary to a Catholic sounds like something a visiting priest might do or, you know, Una Parasera or somebody did. Right. Being a missionary today, particularly in a city like New York, in Soho, a neighborhood I know quite well, yeah. this is bizarre. Right. So the what missionaries do that we're do? used to are they come to the parish mm -hmm. and safely inside the parish right. walls, they conduct a mission right. within these holy huddles that we have. Mm -hmm. And those are very helpful to us in formating our faith mm -hmm. as Catholics. The problem is the largest growing religious denomination in the country are former Catholics. Mm -hmm. And they're outside the wall. So early on in the book, I say to ourselves, look, we're either going to stay inside this wall. There's this wall, as you know, around Old St. Pastor. We're going to go out. So we're out on the streets, literally, looking for souls. And it sounds crazy, but over a decade, we've spoken to over 3 million people. We've had 1,000 missionaries at this. And we think we've brought around 15 to 20,000 back to the sacrament of confession for the first time in a decade, two decades, in one case, six decades. Mm. And, and these folks have had a conversion experience. So how do we do it? Yeah, what do you do? What do you do specifically? Yeah. You, you, we you, use you, the two. Tables walking down the street and you say what? Are you Catholic? Mm. It's a very profound question, Raymond, um, because... Of course, it could just mean, are you Catholic? But it, what does it mean to be a Catholic? And how do you respond to someone who says that? So uh, the, it is the most provocative way to start a, a, an encounter. And if you ask the question with love and joy in your heart, which I would say, if you go back to the early days of Christianity, the way we conquered the world were love and joy. Those were the two characteristics mm -hmm. that distinguish our faith. And I can tell you, on the streets of New York, agape love is something no one knows. But when they see it, yeah. it's whoa. And when they see that coming out of a missionary and they see joy, because they're all chasing yeah, yeah. this secular dream that's supposed to make them happy, quote unquote. And they're deeply unhappy and in their yeah. iPods. And joy is confidence that we know our place in, yeah. in, with the Lord, right? That's Christian joy. The Pope. That was his first encyclical, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think he's right at that stage. So the joy of the gospel. So we're out there, love and joy, we love them in. And when you ask someone that in a joyful, loving way, some of them are inclined to stop and talk to you. Mm -hmm. Some won't. Some Catholics, in fact, the book starts on this dark alley in, in Chinatown mm -hmm. with this ex-con uh, packing a gun. And there's this missionary by himself in the mist with two rosaries mm. uh, and some amazing, something really amazing kind of happens. Mm. But the way the encounter works is the individual walks past the missionary without responding. And the missionaries have found that former Catholics, um, well, sometimes they'll deny they're Catholic, but they almost always come back to us later. It really bothers mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Then we say, well, now we've got another cynic. Yeah, that, you know? <laughs> Uh, uh, but the other one is they'll avoid us. Uh. And we've had some in the, the, the story in the book there, but there, there's another story. Um, the missionary's out uh, on the missionary in this case in a throng. I mean, in Soho, you, you've been there. Yeah. There's nights where it's a throng. Right. You know, as I've told some people, they say, Steve, this is low margin business you got here, you know, <laughs> because it's one out of 40, but we make it up on volume. Uh huh. And I'll be out there, hey, Catholics, any Catholics? And in the corner of my eye, I see a woman who's steering around me. Mm. So I'm saying to myself, she's Catholic. Mm. So unfortunately for her, or fortunately, the light changes, and she can't get across the street in time. Mm. So I chase her down. I say, excuse me, miss, I think you're Catholic. Mm. She says, how did you know that? And a conversation ensues, bottom line, something deeply troubling. We can all guess what these things are. It doesn't matter. But something that I call the unforgiven sin. There's a chapter about this mm -hmm. in the book. And she thinks she can't get back. 
and won't consider confession, which is part of your goal. We want to get them to confession because that's where they can feel the Lord's mercy and realize they are still beloved by the Father. Mm. And um, that is our objective, full stop. Mm -hmm. I'll be very frank with you. How do you do that? I mean, you can't well, get I, Catholics who go every Sunday to go to confession. How are you going to get people well, who've been away all, for years? Virtually the entire parish now has gone to confession. I mean, oh, well, that's a good yeah, plan. none of them were going. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, when we're out there, last Holy Week, we're out there, they all come up to me and say, I, I've been to confession. I ran already, already they, went they yesterday. The, the yeah. passport yeah. stamp. Yeah, I'm in my way now. Okay, so, but uh, with someone like that, it's a, it's a lot of questions. We ask a lot of questions, and we'll say, well, um, how long you've been away from the church? You know, mm -hmm. what have you been doing lately? Uh, how's your spiritual life going? Usually, it's not going well. Um, something bothering you? Well, there is. Okay, and and before you know it, and then we we say, you know, you, I'm too. I, I can't tell the priest. They'll say, you know, mm. it's I'm unforgivable. Mm. And I would say to them, Do you think your sin is bigger than God's? Than God? I mean, God's bigger than any of that. Or I'm too embarrassed to tell the priest. Do you think God doesn't know what you did already? You, you write in the book, the devil shows he is not happy about our new evangelization. How do you know this? Oh, because he's constantly trying to distract us from, from going forward. And I tell the missionaries, it's very interesting. When you feel most tempted to give up, like nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's a slow night. There's no one here. Let me go get a, let me quit early. Literally within minutes, your soul. I, I tell the missionaries, you might be here for one soul. I've learned this over time that each of us has a different mix of backgrounds. I referenced it once with this example of, of, of the man who was converted after a long time. Away. We all have a unique set of characteristics. We're all called to be missionaries. It's one true apostolic faith. It's not just a job for the priests. And each of us has a soul we've been, we've been asked to bring back. And I think we're on the mission. If you've come to the mission, if you've come this far, there's a good chance. But you've got to be here when your soul comes. And the devil will distract you just as your soul is coming around the corner. Mm -hmm. And you'll lose your soul. You can take that any way you want. Mm. Um, and invariably, um, in fact, the book ends uh, with a demonstration of this. And I won't say the actual ending, but the, the missionary is out on the corner. It's Holy Thursday. So on Holy Thursday, all Catholics know there's one Mass. Mm -hmm. So there's a hard stop on the confessions because our priests all have to do the Mass. No one can stay behind. So 645, hard stop. And the missionary is out there past 645. Mm -hmm. I've sent all the missionaries back in, but I can't explain it. I'm a very logical guy. I'm the chief investment officer of Big Mutual, but I'm not stupid. There's no, it doesn't make any sense, but I'm out there on the corner. I know something's going to happen. Sure. And something unbelievable happens. So, yeah, maybe the devil wanted me to give up at that moment, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. and I Some quick questions, because you relate 11 years' worth of stories in the book. First of all, why confine it to Holy Week? It's not confined to Holy Week, Grant. Uh, we quickly <laughs> expanded it. We do do it. We find it's best. This Religious, kind of uh, what I call uh, radical uh, evangelization. Holy days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it works best when it's anchored with some kind of catholic holiday mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it, it's tugging at a catholic so advent mm -hmm. ash wednesday and in new york's the feast of san Gennaro. so we're mm -hmm. out there every season mm -hmm. so i wrote the book partly as a field guide literally to how to do this but mm -hmm. also to inspire people i think there's lessons in this book for all of us in how we can be better evangelists to answer your question beyond Holy Week. All right. What do you say to people who say, we hear this all the time, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. Oh. I really don't need that. Yeah. There's a chapter on that in the book, mm -hmm. Spiritual, Not Religious. My first question is, how's that working for you? 
And if you ask it in a kind of sincere way, uh -huh. you'll get a sincere answer, mm -hmm. which is not well. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then you take it from there. Yeah. What about, and I hear this all the time, I experience God more in nature than within the walls of a church. Yeah, well, it's good that you experience God in nature because he created it. <laughs> but how do, you, how do you know what he's saying to you? You know, and how, how do you know you're, you're following what he wants you to do mm -hmm. without some, you know, some help? Well, breeze, why do you think he came, why breeze. did he come down and sacrifice himself to give us the gift of the church? What, what when you, from your experience, what could not only Catholics watching, but bishops, priests learn? What don't they realize that you've picked up? Uh, well, I don't want to presume there's anything in this book that they haven't realized. But uh, for me, some of the lessons from the book, if you will. Yeah. One, the importance of the sacrament of confession to the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of Catholics get that, some less so. Mm -hmm. And the, you can see, and so, uh, many people have told me, Steve, I'm buying the book to give to give to my kids to get them to think I know they're not going to confession mm. and make them at least think about it so the importance of that law sacrament I call it to the spiritual life we use it as a tool for radical conversion so that's one two this idea that this this battle of light and darkness is real mm. when you you go through this this book and you see these stories you literally see the missionaries grappling with darkness mm -hmm. and people being dragged off into the dark. I mean, there's a real light and darkness thing going on. A another one for me is this thing about walls. Mm -hmm. Like we're all, as Catholics now, because of the culture, we're being driven inside our walls. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's safer there, it's comfortable, we have like-minded people, we have people come in to give us missions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all good. And we may even get ourselves to heaven that way, but we're not going to get others with us. And we are an apostolic faith. We're called, each of us is called, to bring our fellow human beings, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. Another one is love conquers all. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like a truism, but I'll tell you one story. We're sitting here one night, and there's Hindu monk shows up. And I, I'm used to this. You know, we interact with atheists, um, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews. A lot of them end up in the church, by the way, by the time we're done with them. But, you know, so I'm sort of stealing myself for what this is going to lead to. After about 15 minutes, he walks over to me and he says, you know, you guys are never going to convert me. I'm a Hindu monk. And I get it, you're Catholic. Mm -hmm. But I really applaud what you're doing. It's obvious to me that you two guys love every single person you encounter, even the ones who are almost spitting at you. Mm. And I can see it in how you're dealing with them. And that witness is so beautiful mm. and something we need in this city. Mm. So I, I think you know the idea that love never fails is not a truism. It works, mm -hmm. but you got to have it. You right. know, you can't you gotta, make it up. You got to do it. A New Yorker will tell you right away when you're faking it. So, uh -huh. it has to be real love, and the only true love is love through Christ. If we love the Lord, then loving His sons and daughters is simple. We will leave it there, Stephen. Well, thank you thank so you, much Raymond. for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. The Missionary of Wall Street, From Managing Money to Saving Souls on the Streets of New York by Stephen Auth is available in stores everywhere and online.